Have you seen what's happening in your sanctuary lately? Join us right now for another episode of Your Sanctuary, a program that highlights what makes our National Marine Sanctuary so special and the people that keep them that way. Our program today is titled From Whaling to Watching. It's an historical perspective about how whale watching has become such a popular activity. And with me today is Ken Stagnaro, and he's going to speak from his own personal experience. Ken, welcome to your sanctuary. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You bet. You know, you know as well as anybody that the sanctuary has an amazing array of wildlife. And whales are really one of the most popular animals that people come to see. Um, tell us about your business and how you got into this. Well, uh, it's an old family business. We, uh, my family started off in the, in the fishing industry years ago, decades ago in fact. And uh, the whale, uh, the, we started off with the winter whales, the migration of the California gray whales uh, in the winter time. And then the, the humpback whales in the last couple of decades have really uh, uh, populated the bay more so than they did years ago. The population of humpbacks is increasing. And we just found more people are interested in going out and see, seeing the bay and seeing the animals. What is it about being on the ocean that, that draws you and you think draws people out to experience that? I just love showing the animals to the people. I just I get a really a, a lot of gratification from that. And when they see a, a whale or a dolphin or a big pot of dolphins jump right next to the boat or, or swim under the bow, um, the people are just in awe. They had no idea you could see that out there in the ocean. Yeah, I've, I've often heard the Monterey Bay compared to the Serengeti of the sea in terms of the number and diversity of animals that you could see out on the bay on, on any given day. Absolutely. A a any expert will tell you that the Monterey Bay is considered one of the top three places in the world to see um, uh, marine wildlife. I mean, there's five different species of dolphins that, out there that you can see year-round. On average, five to six different types of whales throughout the year, depending on the time of year, and sometimes more, um, and a host of other things. You know, hundreds of different types of seabirds. You know, big albatross, uh, albatross, one of the biggest seabirds in the world. Uh, we see turtles out there occasionally, the big leatherback sea turtle. Uh, just a host of uh, creatures out there that you can see. Uh, just amazing place. Are there any? Uh, memories that come to mind of anything recently that you've experienced in the water that was sure. sort of that big moment. Of Just a couple of weeks ago we had a thousand, a pot of over a thousand dolphins swimming next to the boat and uh, they were performing, which I was describing just a moment ago, aerial jumps that were amazing that even I to this day, I've, I've seen it my whole life, even, even you know just when I was just fishing on, on uh, fishing trips I would see that and now to bring it to the folks that really appreciate it uh, more so is really special and to see a, a dolphin jump 10 feet in the air and do a flip and splash back down is amazing and then last November we had the humpback whales come to Santa Cruz right on the shoreline there which uh, was people just couldn't believe their eyes I mean we had about 10 humpback whales that stayed there for weeks. You've been really good about conveying those messages to folks about uh, appropriate wildlife viewing like how close you should get uh, so you don't endanger them right. or the people themselves. Or yourself. Exactly. Marine Mammal Protection Act, they are protected by three different uh, forms of protection, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Sanctuary Regulations. Um, all require um, that you don't approach animals uh, closer than 100 yards, uh, 50 yards for sea otters and sea lions. If I wanted to go, say, this weekend, how would I do that? We're Stagnaro Charter Boats in Santa Cruz Whale Watching, and you can call us at 831-427. 0230. Well, thanks so much for being on the show and uh, helping us all connect with uh, our sanctuary. No problem. Yeah, I'm glad, glad. Thanks for having me. You bet. All right. Thanks, Ken. Mm -hmm. California has the longest established whale watching industry in the world, with formal boat based whale watching going back as far as the 1950s. It's time now for our Sanctuary Hero segment. And with us is Maris Seidenstecker, who is our hero this week. 
Now, Mara started Save the Whales when she was just 14 years old. Maris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. Can you tell us about how this fantastic organization got started and why at such a young age? Uh, yeah, actually we started in 1977 uh, after I had read an article on an airplane about whales being slaughtered. And I went home in Los Angeles and designed a t-shirt to save the whales. And my mother and I started the organization. We're both co-founders of it, and we're still running it today. So, wow, wow. So the, the name Save the Whales is actually more than a name. You actually do save whales. <laughs> I heard an interesting thing the other day that your organization helped save some 10,000 marine mammals from ship shock testing. You have to tell us what that is. Down in the uh, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Exactly. Tell us about that. Um, in the, in the 90s, the Navy, the U.S. Navy was going to do underwater detonations in the Channel Islands Marine Sanctuary, and it was slated that at least 10,000 marine mammals would die. Um, and we went to court, and we were actually able to stop all the detonations except one. And that was a huge victory. And then the biggest thing, one of the best things that came out of that is we got lawyers from NRDC, which is Natural Resources Defense Council, and they have continued to keep a body of lawyers together to work only on marine mammals and work in conjunction with the Navy. So they continue to work with the Navy to stop underwater efforts that might harm marine mammals. So I think it turned out to be a long-lasting benefit, hopefully for all marine mammals. Well, let's stop talking about whales and let's see some whales. You brought some video of some sperm whales. I did. So could you share that with us? I absolutely. This is spectacular footage of sperm whales off the coast of the island of Dominica. Uh, and sperm whales gather here. Um, they travel here in order to eat because much like our marine sanctuary out here in Monterey Bay, it's a very deep canyon. So there's a lot of upwelling and there's a lot of food. And so the sperm whales come to eat squid, giant squid, and this is a spectacular area to see them. And in the footage, You'll see this family or group of sperm whales. They're swimming around and they're actually they're making clicks, or they're called codas, which is essentially their language. Um, and you can actually distinguish the different groups by their different sounds, or the codas. Maris, that was great video. You know, I remember looking at the video now, an interesting fact about sperm whales. Don't they have the biggest brain of any animal on Earth? Yeah, isn't that amazing? That is. Yeah. So what have you got there? How did, wh where did this come from? What do you have? That's not a baby whale, is it? This is actually a model of a baby vaquita. And vaquita is a porpoise, which is actually a smaller relative of whales. And the vaquita only lives in the Sea of Cortez. It's actually the most endangered marine mammal right now. There's only about 200 or 250 left, and they're actually dying in shrimp nets, which is what I'm holding right here is a piece of shrimp net. We, um, we actually refer to them as the panda of the sea because they have this dark, eye patch around their eye, just like a panda. So the panda of the sea needs your help. Well, Maris, thank you so much, and thank you to Hope as well to visit us, and thank you for all the work you do with Save the Whale. Thank you. The North American whale watching industry accounts for a total of $1.2 billion in expenditures and supports 6,278 jobs. The U.S. alone accounts for nearly $1 billion in expenditures. 
Reporter Deirdre Whalen is in the field with this week's Hospitality Spotlight. Let's go out to Deirdre now and see what's going on. Thanks, Paul. Today we're in Moss Landing with Doris Welch, the owner of Sanctuary Cruises. Doris has had a long and varied background in education, research, and marine science. She's worked with both the University of California at Santa Cruz as well as the Oakland Museum, all before becoming the owner of Sanctuary Cruises. Doris, can you tell us a little bit about Sanctuary Cruises? Sure. Well, with Sanctuary Cruises, we're all about letting people get out there and experiencing the wildlife on a more intimate basis and being able to really go away and feel inspired about the marine world. We love being out there with the animals just as much as our customers do. You know, it's interesting. One of the challenges that we've found in getting people to care more about the ocean is that if they haven't experienced it firsthand, they're not entirely familiar. People may enjoy the ocean by walking along the bike path or just looking out at it, but they don't understand what's below the surface. Has that been your experience as well? It certainly has, and we feel so strongly that it's important to get people out on the water experiencing the bay in its element, really, and on Sanctuary you can do that. Um, it's a wonderful platform for exploring the bay in a very safe manner, and you can even stay dry most of the time. What can you tell us about the connection that people have with whales? It's really remarkable. We get a whole host of different types of people. Some have never been on the ocean before. Some are actually absolutely whale crazy. But what we find is when we have a nice encounter with a whale, people are transformed. It's as if whales are ambassadors for the sea. And when people really get to experience a whale in real life, they'll go away with a deeper caring and understanding about the environment, hopefully becoming a marine steward. You know, our office is interested in doing more in partnership and in collaboration with local businesses to try and promote the presence of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And I'm very struck by the name of your company, Sanctuary Cruises. Can you tell me a little bit about how you selected the name? Well, certainly. The selection of the name Sanctuary for both our vessel and for the business was highly intentional. We've been involved in this Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary since its inception, and we're very committed to the same goals of the sanctuary, of conservation and education and research. And so it's just a perfect fit to have our vessel and our business named Sanctuary. Doris, some of our viewers may not have had the pleasure of going out on a whale watching cruise before. Do you have some video clips that you can share with us? Sure, I'd love to show you some video footage taken by Captain Mike aboard the Sanctuary Cruise. Wow, very cool. Yeah. These are the humpback whales right off Moss Landing here aboard the Sanctuary. Look at that tail. Oh, they're right here again. There they are. Coming right up to us. Coming right here. I mean, okay. Oh, that it just turned. Right, That's his pectoral. Its, it's lying on its back, showing us its belly and its pectoral flippers. Wow. It's waving at us. Oh. Look at this. Oh, wow. This is phenomenal. It's unbelievable. Wow, look at the little rainbow. Wow. Right. Oh, wow. <laughs> look at that. Look at that pectoral plant right next to it. <laughs> Watch your fingers. <laughs> Look at him, he's right here. He's itching himself on the boat. Hold on. Watch yourself, stand back, stand back, stand back. He's upside down. Yeah, watch yourself there. Watch yourself, please. That pectoral fin can come up at any point. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day right before you go out to view whales on the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We really appreciate your efforts. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Measuring 100 feet in length, Blue whales are the largest animal known to inhabit Earth. During the summer months, they feed on large swarms of krill. 
An adult blue whale can consume up to 8,000 pounds of these tiny shrimp-like animals in a single day. Hello, I'm Steve Elzey. Since this episode is from whaling to watching, right now we are going to take a look at Monterey's historic and modern day dependence on whales visiting our bay. Joining us in the studio is a gentleman with a wonderful knowledge of the region's whaling history. He has served three terms as president of the American Cetacean Society and his name is Jerry Loomis. Well, thank you very much. It's a it's a great pleasure to uh, be here. You have a very long history in the Monterey area, uh, 27 years with California State Parks. I am a naturalist at Point Lobos now. I was a ranger and I was asked to come back to work for Point Lobos about four years ago to start a kids camp for kids age uh, 8 to 13. Jerry, could you tell us a little bit about the natural history of whales in this particular area? Well, you know, whales have been evolving for about uh, 45 million years or so, and they started coming to Monterey Bay um, over the course of probably millions of years ago to feed on the richness of the bay, be it squid or schooling fishes or krill. Um, a lot of the whales that come here feed on, on those resources, and then there's, of course, other animals that are associated with the whales and uh, those being uh, orcas and uh, of course the Native Americans used whales that came ashore. Grizzlies would eat the whales that uh, were killed by the whalers and left on the beaches and of course they would eat the whales that died of natural causes. And so whales uh, have been important to the area for many, many years and uh, they, like so many of the animals here in the area, uh, just rely on the richness of the bay. And what about commercial whaling? Uh, when did it start in this area, and, and who was involved in that? Davenport started his first uh, shore whaling station in Monterey, and uh, he worked in Monterey um, after acquiring a lot of the whaling apparatus that uh, was left over after the gold rush. Uh, where a lot of the whalers jumped ship in San Francisco. So he started outfitting the shore whaling stations with this surplus of whaling equipment. And eventually the whaling station at Point Lobos was started and um, probably another 14 whaling stations were, were added along the way. But it was around uh, the 1850s where it started commercially and then there was a uh, a whaling station that operated out of Moss Landing up until about 1921. Why was whaling so lucrative and, and people from around the world were interested in doing it? Uh, whale oil was the energy source of the day at that time. It was Chevron, it was Shell, it was Texaco. It's what people used in their homes to light lamps. They used the products uh, that were rendered out of the whale's blubber for things like soap. They used the baleen for uh, plastic, basically. What is the significance of uh, Point Lobos as a whaling station? It had a dog hole port. It had a place where a uh, flag could be raised so that when whales were going by, the whalers could see it. They could row their boats out. They could come back into a sheltered cove, flinch the whales out, render them down, put the whale oil into casks, and store it, and then ship it. Uh, when whales weren't going by, the uh, Portuguese uh, were farmers. I, I've just got to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for taking the time to come down and share what you know. And I also want to thank you very sincerely for all the wonderful work you have done throughout the years to spend with the visitors to Point Lobos and, and the kids uh, as a naturalist. Uh, Point Lobos has given me more than I could possibly give to Point Lobos. And it's just been a tremendous pleasure to be able to work there. And thank you very much for watching. If you'd like more information about Point Lobos, please go to ampmedia.org, your sanctuary.
Located at the mouth of Massachusetts Bay, the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary sits astride historic shipping routes and fishing grounds for numerous New England ports. During the 18th and 19th centuries, large whaling ships sailed from these ports in search of whales. These days, whale watching and research vessels ply the waters where whales are no longer hunted, but observed and studied by researchers. Currently, scientists working with Stellwagen Bank staff are tagging a number of whales to study their behavior. This particular project is designed to help us understand how baleen whales and humpback whales in particular use the water column in their daily routine. And we're trying to understand that to really protect them from three main uh, human-caused influences. Uh, one is ship strikes, uh, which of course is a big mortality factor in the sanctuary, as well as entanglement in fishing gear, which is also a large mortality factor. And then really an emerging issue, which is acoustic pollution. These animals are extremely acoustic. They communicate acoustically. They probably forage acoustically. Uh, and if you put a lot of sound in the water column, uh, we're not really sure how that impacts them, but it may interfere with some of their communication and ability to forage. So as they're feeding, as they're swimming, as they're doing whatever whales do to try to understand uh, where they are in the water column, how they interact with fish schools that they're trying to forage upon, and even other whales in the vicinity. We use a long pole to put the D-tag on the animals, uh, and the animals are, are moving relatively quickly, uh, and they don't necessarily want a boat very close to them. So we use this long pole uh, with a slow approach to try to get on them as benignly as possible. So the D-tag is then attached with suction cups. So again, it doesn't really harm the animals at all. A very benign attachment. The D-tag is really a great piece of equipment that's designed by Mark Johnson at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And it's a tag that measures pitch, roll, heading, and depth about 50 times a second. It goes on the animals with a suction cup attachment, so it really doesn't bother them at all. And it gives us a very fine scale look at how they're moving their bodies underwater at a particular depth and it'll stay on for up to 20 hours, after which time the tag is full of data. Um, it detaches from the whale, floats to the surface. We pick it up, um, download it to the computers, and begin the data analysis. We then bring in another layer, which is that we're putting pingers around the animals, and because the D-tag also has an acoustic sensor in it, we can pick up the pings that these sensors are making around the animals and triangulate on the position of the whale, again, at a very fine scale. So this will tell us exactly where it is spatially in the water column, things like how fast it's swimming, um, how it's moving its body, particular depths as well. We then also bring in the prey mapping aspect um, using an EK-60 to give us a good picture of forage fields underwater. We're bringing a lot of technology uh, to bear on it from different directions and then trying to synchronize them all into the same question. So now we bring all these things together to get a really revolutionary look at how animals are, are performing underwater. From December through April, gray whales can be seen migrating along the California coastline. The annual 12,000-mile round trip from Alaska to Mexico and back is one of the longest of any mammal. We started our Sanctuary on the Street segment to find out what you think about sanctuary subjects. Let's go to Steve Elsey right now and see what he's discovered. Thank you very much, Paul. We are right here at the edge of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary finding out what people really think. Tell us what you know about whales. They live in the ocean, and they're mammals. Do you know what the largest animal that ever existed is? Um, I think it's a blue whale. A blue whale? How big is a baby blue whale? Ooh. I would say several tons. Is a blue whale's tongue the size of a beer barrel, a refrigerator, or an automobile? Probably an automobile. I thought it was more like a bus. <laughs> the tongue? <laughs> yeah, I'll talk about an automobile. That's a big tongue, okay. What color 
is a gray whale? I guess it was gray. Do gray whales live in Mexico or Alaska? Both. What color are blue whales underwater? Um, white. Kind of dark gray. Probably gray. Gray. Do dolphins eat sea lions? I'm not sure. Not that I know of. Oh, well, it depends on the type of dolphin. If it's like a killer whale, then yes. But if it's like a bottlenose dolphin, no. Is a killer whale a whale, a shark, or a dolphin? It's a whale. I'm sorry? It's a whale. So a killer whale is a whale? Guess what? A killer whale is a dolphin. Can you believe that? Oh my gosh, it's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> so it's weird. weird. All right. Have you ever had a blue whale for dinner? Not an entire blue whale. Would you want a blue whale in your pool? Probably not, because they're really big and they need to eat a lot every day. If you had a family of blue whales over for dinner, what would you feed them? What they usually eat. Krill? Krill. Uh, I think they eat plankton. Probably krill or small fish or that sort of thing, maybe plankton. I would imagine it would be plankton. and um, But the problem is that I don't think we have much in the plankton in the freezer these days, so they might have to settle for spinach. What would you rather do, go whale watching or play Angry Birds? Mm. Whale watching. Okay, Paul, that's what people are thinking on Sanctuary on the Street. Presentation of Your Sanctuary is made possible in part by The Cannery Row Company, Gateway to the Monterey Bay.